name is CRB. It's my pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker, Professor Maurice Follum. Uh, Maurice is an associate professor at the Uni University of Oxford, where he directs the Dynamic Robot Assistance Group. Maurice is also a Royal Society University Research Fellow. For those who are not familiar with the British system, this is a very prestigious title for British university professors. Um, his research focuses on probabilistic method for localization and mapping. He's also well known for his contribution to state estimation for leggy robotic systems. Now, Maurice has been part of many major competitions in leggy robotics. This includes the famous 2015 DAPA Robotic Challenge. If you've seen the video online, this is a challenge where uh, we had to make a humanized robots doing different kinds of tasks outdoor. And if you all remember, this is a video that you will see that all the human and robots failed. <laughs> and recently, uh, Maurice and his collaborators won the last DAPA subterranean challenge. And in this particular challenge, the robot has to navigate in underground environments with sensitive time constraints. Maurice also involved in many uh, important projects. Uh, for me, I have known Maurice mostly through our previous involvement in one of the European funded projects where our goal was to enable quadruped robots to navigate in difficult terrains autonomously. So today he's going to tell us how he can, how he made all this happen uh, with his amazing work on multi-sensor state estimation and 3D mapping. Okay, let's welcome Maurice. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sujin. Um, and it's nice to, to get in touch with you again. Um, like you mentioned, uh, we started out about three, three and a half years ago working on a collaborative project and many of the arcs of the work that we've done kind of are connected to, to what I'll talk about today. So I'll go ahead and do the, the inevitable and share my screen. And, uh, and how do I collapse this? Hide my floating controls, okay. Uh, can you see my screen, uh, Sujin? Is, yes. is everything okay? Yes, all okay. oh, good. All right. good, so I'll, I'll get started then. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, the, for the, the nice introduction and I think you kind of covered my background quite well. Um, and I'm gonna focus today's talk on, um, on quadruped mostly, uh, exploration and navigation, but a kind of underground, underground subterranean theme. And uh, just a little bit about Oxford Robotics Institute. Uh, there's been research in robotics for in Oxford for about 40 years. Um, and our institute, Oxford Robotics Institute is going for about five of those years. We have about seven research groups covering uh, cognitive robotics. Dyn Dynamic Robot Systems Group is, is my group. I co-lead it with Yanis Avutis. Um, groups that are doing um, underpinning machine learning work, autonomous mi machine planning, uh, this group here, uh, Estimation Search and Planning Group, is led by Jonathan Gamble, who's a graduate from Tim Barfoot's group in Toronto, and then Soft Robotics and also Autonomous Vehicles. Um, and this is just an illustration of some of the sort of fielded systems. We have very much a, a field robotics focus with a lot of uh, autonomous vehicles, teacher and repeat, visual navigation, but uh, things like legged robotics fit nicely within that scope. And my own background, uh, I spent quite a number of years after my PhD in MIT uh, working on, on navigation in SLAM. This is Marine Vehicles, John Leonard's group. Um, this is mapping of, uh, of buildings using lasers and, and, and IMUs and vision. And then I moved into, I had the opportunity to, to work in legged robotics, as, as Suchin mentioned, uh, worked on the Atlas robot. And this is kind of what it culminated in, uh, the uh, 150 or 180 kilogram Atlas robot doing a variety of tasks while being kind of remotely piloted by a robot by a person that's out of line of sight so um and then we put a lot of focus on locomotion and for, for that i was working on the state estimator that was running in the control loop um, and uh, some of my colleagues uh shown in this picture and all the ones in in red in this picture actually have gone on to form the nucleus of the atlas team at mit uh, led actually by by scott kindersma so uh, that was kind of a very formative time and it was kind of an experience to see that being involved in large scale projects can, can allow you to develop science that, that sort of can be very impactful. Uh, reflecting on the complexity of, of humanoids, I, I've focused on quadrupeds, you know, four legs, better than two legs as they say in Animal Farm. And I've, I have a joint lab that I'm, I'm leading with Yanis Avutis in the back right here, 
Um, I focus on navigation and perception, and Yanis' uh, primary focus is on motion planning and control. And I'll talk a little bit today about uh, locomotion before mostly talking about navigation. And if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about some applications of our work um, that are outside of legged systems. So the first thing I'm going to talk about um, is a MPC-based system, and this is a bit of a scary block diagram, but effectively at the core of it is model predictive controller for quadrupeds in which body positions and feet trajectories are planned and then executed. And um, it, it built off a piece of work from um, ETH in Zurich called Tower, which uh, had a very simplified model for body motion. So it effectively planned the motion of a foot within this blue box, which was the reachability of, of the next foot step, and then solved for trajectories that could execute it. Now, not that much of it was realized on real hardware. And you can see those, those very aggressive body roll motions that you can see here are very difficult to actually realize uh, in reality. So uh, as illustrated in the bottom right, we worked to adapt that particular trajectory optimization approach to have more realistic constraints on the motion. So here you can see the body roll and the, the footstep trajectories are a little bit more plausible and realistic. And then on the right hand side, you can see that the, the execution of some of these, so these are all from the, the, the adapted approach um, that a student called Oliver was, was developing. And these are all trajectories that are planned out uh, with about four or five seconds of future trajectory, but then executed basically with an underlying whole body controller stabilizing them. So the controller here is getting a six or four or five, six second trajectory and then executing it all in one go, with no replanning. One of the work that we've done is to build this greater system that can use heuristics and, and also learn models to give an initial seed to the planner because the, 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 the challenge is not necessarily stabilizing these kind of tra trajectories of the, of the walking robots, but planning them and adapting them to the terrain at hand. Um, so this is a, just an illustration of one of the other works that we, we did. We, we modified the reachability constraint around the robot's feet so that was, so they could give more plausible constraints. So you can see previously this jerky motion was a result of the robot effectively using those blue boxes around its feet and using using them to reach with contact points. We adapted also uh, the, also to use more sensor perception. So this is detecting edges um, and also detecting uh, contact regions. So avoiding edges and preferring to place uh, footsteps in that central region. And then this, this, this illustration on the right-hand side is a video showing uh, the quadruped also adapting its height to the to the clearance above the ground. So in front of the robot and, and, and around the robot, you can see this sort of slice that is illustrative of a safe place where the robot can keep its torso while still being able to reach the ground. And still we needed to, um, to uh, accommodate the challenge of, um, of um, being able to replan maybe a few times per second uh, with a receding horizon. So here we're planning ahead about one and a half seconds and uh, on the left-hand side is an illustration of, of a variety of, of adaptive, to, um, adaptive terrains that were used to train um, our, our policy to seed our planning algorithm. And on the right-hand side, you can see some receding horizon. Finally, some, some results um, showing uh, the, the algorithm running in real time. So this is now a system that instead of being from stationary to stationary is, is able to achieve continuous motion by planning several steps ahead. Another um, locomotion uh, planning work that we, we had was called, it's called RLOC. It's called Reinforcement Learning and Optimal Control. So it's a kind of a hybrid locomotion system that, that incorporates reinforcement learning trained in simulation to allow the robot to do things like footstep planning entirely based off of learning. Um, it can adapt the body's posture based off of, uh, of being trained in learning, but it's, it's feeding through a, to a model-based controller, which allows us to have a little bit more um, observability about how its behavior would be. So this is the work of Sid Gangapurwala. And one of the key steps is trying to interface reality to simulation. Um, or so the, 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 the challenge of, of, of real world data true to um, the robots, uh, the, the robot trying to execute these plans. One of the challenges with, for example, using downward facing depth cameras to reconstruct the terrain around the world. So using depth cameras uh, like real sense cameras or connect cameras is that often you have spurious things around the edges 
of, of, of uh, obstacles. So if you have, say, a series of steps, then the boundaries around those edges can be, can be quite difficult to reconstruct, especially with the robot sensors continuously shaking. So one of the challenges uh, that we've overcome in this work is to develop a, a denoising convolutional encoder to take, for example, simulated depth maps to generate some sort of plausible um, noise that you would have in reality. So those might be the bumps and kinks due to, um, due to uh, measurement inaccuracies from your depth camera. And then in simulation, we're able to generate more plausible uh, denoised uh, elevation maps, which, which can then be used as the basis of footstep planning. Those are passed through to the learned footstep planner. And here you can see the decision space is a discrete sample set in front of the robot. And then with this denoised autoencoder, we can train uh, the robot effectively where it should stand and also allow it and also train it to adapt its body motion. So we have a variety, a programmatic, um, a programmatic variation of a variety of different terrains, not just the simple staircase, but like cracks, um, uh, slopes and so on. And, the, and uh, both the footstep planner and the body adaptation planner, the body ad adaptation planner effectively allows the robot to do things like lean forward when going upstairs, lean back when going downstairs. And that uh, gives us a policy that effectively sits just before the controls, the, 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 low, the whole body controller to effectively allow the robot to choose where to put its feet and also to adjust its body posture so as to be able to do things like uh, as demonstrated in this, uh, this example. So this has been a successful piece of uh, controls work from our lab and it's just coming out in TRO. If you can see the, the reference at the bottom, it's called RLOC. Um, so moving on to um, the bulk of the remainder of my talk, which is kind of on, on multi-sensor factor graphs um, for legged systems. Any of the quadrupeds that are on the market, uh, whether it's the Animal D robot that just arrived into Suchin's lab this week, or the Spot, for example, have on board a multitude of sensors. So I'll just give a quick run through for those who don't focus on legged robotics, that maybe looking at the importance. Obviously, you have LiDAR, so there's a Velodyne on this one, and Houster LiDAR on the spot. Um, uh, automotive sensors that are used for like odometry and SLAM. Um, you also have depth cameras. For example, there's about five on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the spot, and then I think there was about five initially on the, on the animal, um, used to build a terrain map around the robot that can be used for footstep planning. Um, but Legged robot specific, we have uh, internal to the robot, uh, an IMU, so we have an X-Sense IMU within the, the animal, gives you that basic orientation estimate and joint sensing. So with regard to state estimation on the legged robots, uh, there's actually sort of different use cases that are important. So oftentimes we wanna be able to use legged sensing and the IMU within the control loop because that gives us a maybe multi hundred Hertz um, state estimate that can be used for closing the control loop and that can give us a very accurate estimate of body velocity and orientation. While for others, other modalities such as terrain mapping, we have a depth cameras that are being computed at 10 Hertz. We wanna rely on other sensors such as visual odometry or laser odometry to give accurate reconstruction. And, and that's primarily where the focus of some of our work is as well as general navigation of, um, of large scale environments. So I'll talk a little bit about the context and the challenges that we have in legged robot systems, kind of motivated a little bit by the DARPA subterranean challenge, which just finished up in September last year. It was a large scale treasure hunt for robots to explore underground environments and to basically report back treasure, which was kind of um, backpacks or fire extinguishers or mannequins, uh, sort of within a disaster relief kind of context. And you, you, you had an hour to, to explore the environment. And as you can see, multiple robot modalities. It's a, a drone that's landed after, after having a malfunction. But early in the competition, you can see here that mud and uh, standing water and slipperiness were, were major challenges. Um, and motivated by this and also by the, the Thing project that, uh, that um, the Su Chin has been involved in collaborating with, with, with me, developing it so that, for example, we don't have falls. So one of the first things we, we, we worked on was to incorporate leg odometry and visual odometry. And we started to build up a system which is now known as VLANS. It's got a complex back acronym of a, of a, of a title, but effectively it's fusing vision, inertial or IMU sensing, leg odometry sensing, and also now laser uh, as a sort of uh, Swiss army, uh, army knife of 
uh, sensor fusion. So we can get kind of the, the best of all of these modalities. Um, from the legodometry, uh, key challenge is how you actually interact with the real world. So when, or, when on the left-hand side is the idealized scenario where contact is precise point contact, well, in the reality, you've, you've a lot more challenging situations is just simply making a foot coming into the contact and being rigidly in contact. You have, you know, as the sort of the GIF kind of plays back again, you have uh, sinkage. So you have deformation, particularly in that muddy ground that we saw there before. Um, you have slippage. So the foot may not stay in, in rigid contact. And you also have mechanical deformation, particularly for, for humanoids, but also for, for quadrupeds, that the actual, the actual joints can bend due to the forces and this is kind of uh, seen, the effect of this is seen in state of estimation drifts. So here you can see an example of uh, the quadruped robot here uh, walking over rubble, its feet continuously sort of slipping between the, the, the large stones. And as a result, state estimators such as the onboard state estimator used in the robot and our own work pronto showing significant drift in the upward direction relative to ground truth. So we had a laser projector that was, or a laser scanner that was connected to, or laser reflector that was on the robot, and we're able to infer what the drift was. And it's common to see that the drift rates are high when you move into sort of environments where there's loose rock or mud, for example. So we took all, uh, uh, factor graphs, which are a, um, uh, 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 a methodology for fusing together different sensor modalities. So IMU and vision is probably the most common approach used in visual inertial uh, odometry, visual inertial navigation, algorithms such as uh, SVO and um, OCFIS, for example, take the approach of um, using an IMU as a kind of a spine or backbone for your odometry, and then extracting visual features in corners uh, and tracking them over time. What we wanted to do was to combine all of this modality with contributions for leg odometry. But any of these estimators are least squares estimators. So they're moving, uh, moving uh, windowed smoothing uh, least squares estimators that kind of minimize error from all of these terms. One of the challenges, again, going back to this previous slide, is that kinematics tends not to be a zero mean Gaussian. So there's kind of a slack due to either the deformation or the terrain. And what we proposed at that time was to estimate this deformation or this, uh, this inaccuracy as a sort of slack variable within or a bias within the, uh, the estimation framework. And this is a, effectively becomes a bias of the legodometry velocity. So we have linear velocity terms from the joint sensing, effectively when we assume a foot is in contact, but we have a term which allows us to reject that term, reject that the biases that are result in this. So because we have an over-parameterized estimation problem, the error between the vision and the LIDAR can be put down, or the vision and the, the kinematics can be put down to being uh, as a result of the kinematics. So we get the best of both worlds of fusing these modalities. And here's an illustration of, of this, that system running on, on real data. So you can see blue visual features being tracked in the bottom left, and they're in 3D in the, in the, in the RVIS view. And effectively, this is combining together both the legodometry and the vision. And you can see compared to ground truth, again, from the laser prism that's just about visible in the front of the, of the, of the, of the, of the animal, you can see um, very accurate high fidelity reconstruction with high frequency. And this can then be used to do things like terrain mapping or uh, potentially incorporation within the control loop. Um, and I'll move on now and talk about how we would then incorporate extensions for vision and LIDAR. So vision, obviously, and LIDAR are the, the dominant sensor modalities for any system, whether it's legged or non-legged. And this piece of work, um, which was actually nominated for Best Paper Award at ICRA last year, um, is, is not in, in any way linked to quadrupeds. We, we, we do demonstrate it on, on the quadruped, and it is, is kind of a, 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 it, is, it is integrated on our, on our legged robot, but it's, it can be both deployed on handheld and, and, and quadruped systems. In fact, the bulk of this work took place in, in 2020 when we had no access to our, our robot and we were doing most of our development with data sets that were made with these handheld sensors that we developed. So it's a Velodyne laser or, or HESE actually is one of the, the ones we prefer now, uh, an embedded IMU and cam a camera system that has a significant degree of overlap. So the way it's set up is that the camera system, uh, typically we're using it the originally a real sense, has visual overlap with the laser 
and that allows us to, to do depth transfer. So we're able to track visual features in the camera images, um, but then infer the depth from the LiDAR. And, that, and, and the kind of interplay between the, these sensor modalities is important. Most of the systems that were being developed for the, um, the DARPA sub T challenge, for example, had combinations of visual inertial or LiDAR inertial, and we're trying to combine them together. And, and, and while these systems individually have become quite mature and high, highly accurate, joining them together so that you can get the best of both worlds. So for example, when you're walking down a, down a corridor underground and you cross through a period, a, a, a location where you have no visual features, for example, when it's dark, or if you're in a very long corridor where uh, lighter is, is inherently degenerate, to be able to, 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 to fuse together those modalities without having just block switches between them. Uh, typical fusion approaches at this point um, are either have hard switches between those modalities or have very significant computational requirements. So what we did in this, this particular work uh, on VLANs was to um, have joint optimization between the, the vision and LiDAR odometry. And we sort of developed a very sparse approach um, or very lightweight approach that, that sort of did a few, few technical subtleties that allowed us to be able to avoid having these hard switches. So these, these are these red circles are illustrations of where in some of the teams competing in the DARPA subterranean challenge, they had either multiplexers or health evaluation or health monitors. Those are effectively deciding which of the modalities, whether it was vision, LIDAR or legged robots, the legodometry could be used at any particular time. And these, these approaches tend to be very difficult to actually tune. If you change, for example, your sensor mod, mod configuration, then you have to change how you fuse things together. Our approach was to use, again, factor graph based estimators um, to track all of the sensor modalities on a low level primitive base. So um, visual feature tracking, edges and planes in the LiDAR. And then we have uh, one of the key subtleties was how we could still achieve uh, factor graph based estimation, which is typically assumed to run at about 10 hertz, despite all of these heterogeneous sensor modalities. And obviously there's some experimental results. I'll, I'll explain a little bit again, going back to the least squares uh, optimization framework. Now we don't have any leg odometry contribution in this particular piece of work, but we have the same least squares um, optimization frameworks. So we have terms for uh, IMU, again, the backbone of our system is the uh, the rotation rate and, and acceleration integration um, using the, using the pre-integration work from uh, Forrester and et al. And then we have plane tracking from the lasers, uh, line tracking, so those are corners and edges, uh, corners and edges in door frames, for example, or in pillars, for example. And then we're tracking also visual features. And then this is track, this is then optimized in a windowed smoothing optimization solved with the GT SAM solver from Frank Dellert's group in Georgia Tech. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about what that looks like. So on the visual feature tracking, sort of corners and edges that are that are tracked over time, not particularly significant novelty in this particular part. We're using fast features and tracking them with a KLT feature tracker. But on the vi on the lighter feature tracking, so as to be able to have extended constraints over time, as opposed to the loam based approach, which tracks um, over a very short time frame, uh, we extract edges and planes and then fit primitive uh, primitives that you can see here so edges and planes we can detect those in their vicinity uh, in subsequent frames reassociate them and they, then they form temporal constraints over time and one of the key challenges i alluded to earlier was that um that if you were to simply use the, the native frame rates of these sensors they're not um they're not hardware synchronized in that the camera image frame they're, they're not hardware triggered, they're synchronized, they're clock synchronized, but they're not hardware triggered. So we don't capture an instantaneous laser scan and a camera image at simultaneously the same time. The laser is continuously spinning and once every 10 seconds we get a point cloud and the camera images, they're, they're globally synchronized. So once every, well, it could be 10 or 30 Hertz, we're getting a camera image, but the precise synchronization or the precise timing of the exposure of the camera and the laser beam starting is not synchronized so if you were to try to incorporate them then you end up with effectively doubling or tripling the number of nodes in the factor graph um, and that becomes very difficult and there's a lot of bookkeeping that would, might be necessary instead what we did was we recognized that the, the, the lighter point cloud is arbitrarily assigned a particular timestamp when it's transmitted by the driver and we recognize that 
if there's a camera image timestamp within the, the start and end of the sweeping time of the LiDAR, we can actually take advantage of the um, motion correction that's going on in our, in our laser odometry module and actually project the laser point cloud to have taken place as though it, it was instantaneously captured at the, at the timestamp of a camera image. So effectively, every time we have a, a laser point cloud, we correct the motion due to the self motion of the, of the platform. And we project it as though it took place at the camera timestamp, uh, which, is, which is something that we look up from our, from our factor graph. And in doing so, we're able to, to move from sort of a disorganized factor graph that you can see on the left hand side with some poses to do with, for example, camera images and some to do with LiDAR scans. Something that's, that's much more organized. There's either constraints from the vision and LiDAR um, to different uh, structure in the scene, or um, or we we may, for example, not always have a, a lighter a lighter point cloud if the frame rates are slightly different. Um, so, um, finally, combining the, the vision and the lighter systems together with the legodometry that I talked about previously, this is kind of now becomes a very modular factor graph. It's simply configured based of an, an YAML file. If we have if we're running on a legged robot, we can include. Um, that sensor modality, if we're uh, handheld or on a wheel platform, then we have a different set of sensor modalities. Um, and um, this is an illustration of its performance within one of the earlier DARPA challenge runs. Um, it was just before COVID. You can see here um, in yellow are the visual features that are being tracked both in the camera image snippet in the bottom left and on the right hand side being tracked in, in space. I'll pause it in case everything's blurred. Uh, due to the video streaming. And red, you can see edges. So the edges would be kind of the, the building corners or poles that are present in the environment. And then the green patches are, are planes uh, that, are, that, are, that are present. You can see as, as the robot's moving around, the characteristic arc of a cooling tower of a, of a decommissioned nuclear plant. In fact, it was never actually commissioned. It was, it was mothballed. Um, and the green line corresponds to ground truth because um, DARPA gave us access to the prior model that was scanned with tripod-based scanners. That, that was kind of core to our tuning and, and algorithm development. Uh, and then we put it all together within a control system. Uh, that's the RLOC uh, reinforcement learning controller that I talked about previously, um, just to show you how it, it how it actually incorporates. So it's, it's used for long range navigation and also for terrain mapping. So the high frequency vision laser here is being used to reconstruct the terrain around the uh, around the robot, and then is used to allow the the reinforcement learning walking controller that I talked about previously to plan its footsteps and to um, to move around the, the world. And here's here's another demonstration outdoors. So they it's both the the carpet, the elevation map around the robot, um, being precise and accurate even when in locomotion and um, obviously for, for obstacle avoidance of these trees and, and structure that you see there. Here's a curb that the robot's, robot's going to walk down. I'm not sure exactly why it stopped. I think it's just to get the video camera in place. And then up again on the other side. Okay, so that's on the legged systems. I'm going to talk, I'm going to skip over the sort of this, this, these few slides in the interest of staying coherent. Um, another work that we did because the the robot for the DARPA challenge was equipped with a variety of cameras facing in different directions. There was uh, a four, uh, four camera synchronized system in which we had high field of view cameras that were looking both in the forward direction and in the lateral direction. We developed a piece of work that, that can use all of these cameras to, uh, to track odometry. So it's a multi-camera visual inertial odometry system. So we're building upon the same visual feature tracking that we saw previously, but now because we have cameras facing in lots of different directions, we can actually take advantage of the redundancy that that gives us. Here you can see the forward looking camera from one of the two cameras and the left and left and right facing cameras, which also have a degree of overlap. They don't have as much overlap as we'd like, but from the manufacturer, a company called Seven Sense, you can see that there's overlap in which parts of the camera images are have, have overlap. And what we can do is we can track visual features for an extended period of time. I'll just show you this video to give you an idea about what it looks like. We can track visual features for an extended period of time. And as they move from the front cameras to the side cameras, as we move past objects, we can maintain tracks. Just show, show that sequence again. 
we can maintain tracks for longer periods of time. We can also switch to primar primarily tracking sideward facing cameras when, for example, the, the operator chooses or the robot, uh, inconvenient robot chooses to move towards environments. We can also overcome scenarios where we, may, we might not have a depth cue because structure is very far away. So in this particular scenario, we're, we've walked up to a wall, we have lots of visual features on this camera, we have some here that might be useful, and then from on the right-hand side, we might not have depth. So this particular work worked to both track these visual features, but also to carefully select which ones would then go into optimization. Again, op the optimization is a, a bit of a bottleneck, and by choosing based off of, um, off of the information gain of individual features, we, we select some of the features that are shown here in bold, um, and we track those and insert those within the optimization framework. And we have effectively a multitude of visual features. So this is the work of Linton, and effectively we have a combination of, of stereoscopic features that can be tracked from the stereoscopic forward-facing camera, monocular ones that can be tracked with the side-facing cameras, and again, solving this, uh, solving a windowed bundle adjustment uh, with factor graphs. Again, this is the overarching theme of the talk. And here's some illustrative examples uh, on one of our handheld devices. And Linton is specifically trying to uh, demonstrate that the algorithm can work when you walk up to, uh, let me see if I can, so, uh, when you walk up to, for example, a textureless environment and you need to switch between camera modalities. So it's the combination of the multi-camera odometry and the IMU allows you to uh, kind of be robust despite all of these challenges. I'll just skip forward to one of the highlight points of this video. Here, Linton is, is aggressively shaking the camera, sort of getting his upper body workout. Um, and by, by basically having a wide field of view, multiple cameras and, and the IMU, you're, you're able to be robust to, to those kind of challenges. So this is an odometry system, not a slam system, just, just pure odometry. Um, and here you can see another example going up a very narrow corridor. It's in a, in a college in, in Oxford. It's a building that's uh, about five to 600 years old. And you can see as you're moving up through the narrow staircases, um, there is a lot of um, change in the visual features that are being tracked at any particular time. And by being able to switch between forward or lateral facing cameras, uh, we're able to track motion going up this, this very narrow environment. We're not and we're obviously not paying any particular attention of where we're facing the cameras. It's just that by having that multi-sensor odometry, we're able to um, merge between them. Now, moving on, uh, I'll just give a little summary of the DARPA challenge. Um, there are a few videos um, from Costas Alexis, the group, the project lead, Marco Hooter, the, um, the assistant lead of the, of the team, explains how the competition finished, and there's a variety of DARPA and uh, other competitor videos, but effectively we ended up kitting out four of the robots for the competition as well, uh, four of the legged robots, um, as well as a series of, of, of ground-based robots. We actually entered the competition after we started, uh, after it started, because it aligned so much with all of the work that we've been doing underground exploration. And we're thankful to, to Costas for, for going to the effort of, of, of allowing us to join. Just to give you an idea about what was necessary, um, five robots were kitted out for the DARPA challenge. Um, as you can see, five, sorry, quadruped robots, as well as a variety of different drones. And the main modifications for the quadrupeds led by ETH were the multi-camera system that I've alluded about to previously, a laser-based mapping system for the front and back of the robot to give better terrain reconstruction, um, Wi-Fi breadcrumbs. So these are Wi-Fi modules. Um, they're standard off-the-shelf modules made by a company called Rajant that basically were dropped off the back of the robot and popped up an antenna so that the robot could maintain connectivity. And also uh, a Jetson was incorporated for um, detection of the objects of interest. Um, and the key enabler for the challenge was even more impressive, like uh, uh, reinforcement learning work from Marco Hooters Group and ETH, which was kind of the, the backbone of the system in which the robot uh, was able to, to operate for the entire challenge without falling. There was four robots on in the field and in no, no case in the, in the prize run did a single one of the animal robots uh, fall on the ground, which was a kind of a, a very key achievement for, for Marco and his team. And we also had the aerial robots that I mentioned previously, uh, effectively flying uh, ousters, ouster lidars with, a, with minimal computation. The environment, the challenge didn't really favor quadruped or aerial drones because of the ability to stop and to detect 
the artifacts of interest. Uh, here's an illustration, however, of the exploration planner. So it's effectively building a large scale reconstruction of the environment, building an occupancy map, um, fusing together mostly the LIDAR and the IMU in this particular platform. And you can see an illustration of the uh, of Costas Alexis's group's GB planner um, exploring the environment. I think the, 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 the paper around this work actually won um, uh, for, Mar for Costas and his team uh, a best paper award at ICRA last week. Um, and we did a lot of testing. Unfortunately for Oxford, that's the best, as best as it's good. We were packed up and ready to go to the finals. And unfortunately, uh, we were denied travel due to COVID and the rest of the team traveled, but we were unfortunately unable to, to make it to the finals. Um, Marco and uh, Costas' teams from, from ETH in Zurich and uh, NTNU in Norway now uh, came away with the $2 million prize. And this is some illustration of the, the maps from the different robots. Um, and again, I, I'd encourage you to, to, to look, if you're interested in the DARPA challenge, to look up some of the other videos from um, both Team Cerberus, uh, our team, and also uh, from Timothy Chung, who's the, the main organizer. So it could give you an overview of the state of the art there. Now, I have a little bit of more material to cover, and I think I have to run until about um, until about 15 minutes past. So I have another 10 minutes or so. I'll talk a little bit. Hi. Plenty of time, so you can, you know, we okay. put a lot of buffer in the schedule. So, okay, so, okay. well, in, in that case, I, I have a few more topics of, of interest that I'll talk about. Um, one is another topic that we're working on in, in odometry, both legged and non legged. Um, there's a very interesting work that's in sort of cyber, cyber phys physical systems looking at how you can more effectively use inertial sensing to. Um, to do odometry without relying on vision. So obviously with vision, well, for one thing, it's computationally intensive. So there, the, so the, so battery battery power is, 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 is an issue. But in many use cases, for example, tracking cell phones to be able to give you that blue dot in an indoor environment where you don't have access to highly detailed Wi-Fi, there's been work, for example, from Mickey Dragoni's group in Oxford and also from, uh, from this, this very interesting work called TLIO from a student that visited uh, Facebook, um, Wexin Liu, um, on being able to just use an IMU to do odometry. And, and in the first instance, this is usually deemed to be very, very much impossible. We, use it, we have this mentality that if you want to integrate an IMU, you have to take the accelerations and integrate them to velocities and then integrate the, the, the velocities to positions, which typically has runaway error because of biases. But these works are looking at basically taking batches of IMU to, data and in, in doing so being able to infer the biases and to keep IMU integration working very well and um, so some nice videos on both that can show um, few cent few percentage drift rates on inertial sensing um, and this is something that we we wanted to look at with our own system on legged robots and it's led by Russell Buchanan who's actually a McGill graduate uh, and a PhD student in my group uh, we wanted to look at adapting state estimator this is, this is an earlier version of our of our uh, our vlan system called pronto and um, to incorporate within that the imu buffer scenario so, so the idea is to collect and to train a network that's based off of just uh, imu measurements and, and possibly joint encoder measurements and building up um an, a, a history of of a sequence of imu measurements so in the order of one second of data using that to probe a neural network for uh, the displacement and the uncertainty that is a, as a result of that batch of IMU measurements. So you, if you have uh, trained this network um, and uh, with uh, representative of data from that kind of locomotion, so for example, you need to train the network with robot locomotion data if you wanna be able to have it predict uh, what the displacement was. But then this displacement measurement, so relative distance between two time frames, can then be used to, to constrain an EKF, for example. So we're estimating within this module pronto the rotation, position, velocities, and biases of the, the, leg, the legged robot using no external sensing. But this allows us then to constrain the relative, placement, relative displacement and then to um, to effectively have a proprioceptive only state estimator that uh, can be robust to, particularly robust to 
when your foot sensing is not as you would expect. So we trained it with a batch of data of the animal robot walking over um, a terrain obstacles, soft terrain. This is a, a piece of, uh, of um, whiteboard that we've put. Um, actually, it's hand sanitizer. And then as the robot's walking over that, it slips quite aggressively. And this is, allows us to basically infer the mapping between a bundle a batch or buffer of IMU measurements and what should be the relative displacement. And in doing so, we can effectively downweight the legodometry and trust more the IMU in this particular scenario. And this is kind of results that were presented at Cora last year that showed that with the legged robotics or the, the proprioceptive estimators, tr traditional proprioceptive estimators, you can you get these kind of drift rates that are shown in, in cyan and, and light blue. But then by incorporating the leg odometry measurements, both in uh, soft terrain and slipping terrain, by in, sorry, by incorporating the learned odometry, we're able to significantly reduce the drift rate in this scenario. What we'd like to focus towards is to be able to have an odometry system that um, is no longer dependent on strong assumptions on which feet are in contact so that when a robot would slip, for example, on this slippery terrain here, or or when its feet are very are on very spongy terrain, you're still able to infer the body velocity, and then that makes it much easier for the control system to, 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 to be stable in those kind of scenarios. Um, now I'm just uh, yeah okay. So I think um, uh, moving back to handheld mapping systems. So we did a lot of work both developing uh, integration on the legged robot system, but also in the, in the handheld system that I showed earlier. This is a handheld system carried around. Um, and we're building a large scale map using uh, PoseGraph Slam. And this allows us to basically take our, our local mapping and then to keep maps consistent over extended periods of time using PoseGraph optimization. I don't necessarily think there's that, that this is particularly novel, although uh, we, we have developed, for example, interesting loop closure technique uh, algorithms for sort of visual, visual registration. Um, but one of the things that we've done is to within the context of the DARPA challenge is to develop a large scale reconstruction system. So this is collaborative work with Stefan Leutniger's group in, in Imperial. It's uh, adapting an, an algorithm called Super8, which maintains multiple different resolutions of reconstruction. So at different depths of an occupancy map, the algorithm actually maintains uh, four different densities of reconstruction. Um, so, uh, this allows you to have very detailed reconstruction close to the sensor. So this is the sensor moving around in this direction here. We have very detailed reconstruction down to a couple of centimeters of, of, of resolution. But then when far away, when ray casting becomes less accurate and also more computationally intensive, you can see the blue one is more blurred and, and of lower resolution. So this is more like, I think, 20 centimeters of accuracy. So this multi-resolution fidelity allows you to have high accuracy reconstruction. You can see the brick patterns of this, um, of this college environment in Oxford uh, nearby, but then you've uh, sort of gradiated accuracy uh, further away. So this is a, a volumetric reconstruction um, system that doesn't, trade off, doesn't need to trade off accuracy against range. We're having high accurate reconstructions close by where you might want to be able to plan a pathway through a narrow passage, such as the one that's illustrated at the very end of the sequence. So there's a narrow passageway here. And then to allow the system to scale up to large scale environments, we incorporated that within a, a, a submapping system. So here, this is, is kind of illustrative of this, the separation between different submaps. So effectively, as the, the robot, or in this case, the handheld system moves between different environments, we can uh, reconstruct parts of the environment with spatially constrained submaps. So we have a, a submap that stretches out to about 40 meters around, uh, around the robot as it's moving, and then we start another submap. And our work looked at trying to scale reconstruction to uh, scale with the scale, scale linearly with the volume that's being explored as opposed to with the time that's being explored. So we're not looking at the pose graph here, we're looking at a series of submaps uh, they're, they're, they're indicated by the color of the poses that are, that are visualized here. And as we've explored in this environment area here in the middle, the number of submaps has stayed um, consistent. 
And as we move around in the large part of the environment, it increases linearly with the area that's been explored or the volume that's been explored. And now after the environment has been fully explored, you can see that the submap counter is no longer increasing. So this is allowing a volumetric uh, occupancy map based reconstruction to scale to an environment that's that's in the order of two or 400 meters uh, across. Um, okay, I've, um, I'm gonna just talk about one other other application. So we, we've effectively been able to uh, develop large scale, very accurate reconstruction systems. And one of the, the things that just for maybe for the interest of, of maybe people on the industry side or people who are interested in where their research would go, um, that, that having these large scale mapping systems can open up very interesting applications. This is a collaboration we've had with the University of Bristol in which one of our handheld devices that you can see here, it was actually supposed to go onto a spot robot, but the spot didn't get shipped because of battery problems. But we uh, loaned it to a collaborator in the University of Bristol who took it to Chernobyl in September last year and uh, carried out a series of operations to build radiation maps of, this is the control, control room of uh, the Chernobyl facility. Uh, it was the room in which the, uh, in which decisions were being made in 1986 about the uh, about whether to shut down the reactor or not, and you can see here some 3D reconstructions uh, from the handheld system. Here's another uh, reconstruction from the the device being carried through uh, one of the reactors. The react this is the reactor adjacent to the one that exploded in 1986, um, and while it's not shown here, we're able to label and colorize these reconstructions according to. Uh, the radiation that's present, so mostly gamma radiation, and Br Bristol and uh, Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian Nuclear Authority are interested in using this technology to be able to do re recurring, particularly for health physics, so uh, to, to allow people to um, make decisions about when it's safe to enter an environment, um, and also to do regular recurring um, reconstructions. For example, this is a facility for high-grade nuclear waste called Bablinsky, it's adjacent to uh, the main uh, reactor facility. And simply by walking around this facility, you can build accurate reconstructions and then label them according to gamma radiation levels. And you can use that to monitor, for example, whether there's been seepage of any of the nuclear waste out of the facility or perhaps into, into the water. And that's one of, one of the most interesting applications of our work. We're also looking at natural applications. So this is uh, what started out as a final year undergraduate project looking at scanning forests and building accurate reconstruction so this is a forest in finland uh, that's being reconstructed with handhelds with the handheld sensor that i talked about previously you can see the reconstruction showing the, the footsteps of the person walking through it and what the forestry environment are interested in doing is to identify individual tree instances to measure the quality of their growth this is a this is actually a natural growth forest, but in forest environment, forestry environment, you're interested in what's the what's the the um, quality of the first six meters of a, of a trunk, for example, that can be used for for reconstruction. And we're working with some of the collaborators from the DARPA project, both um, uh, Costas Alexis and Marco Hooter, and also Stefan Leutnager, on uh, developing robotic technology for the monitoring of forests. So at this stage, I think I'm going to jump to the end and skip over this last topic. I'm happy to take some questions uh, from the audience. Thank you very much. Hopefully you can still hear me. Okay, Su Chen. Okay, thank you for the amazing talk and sharing so many uh, successful stories about um, Lady Robot going to the field. So I'm sure every single video they show us is a couple months of work behind it. Mm -hmm. That's all right. Make... Um, so, um, is there any questions from the audience? Uh, I could see one hand up earlier. If you have a question, can you please use the reaction button and raise your hand there? Okay, um, I have a question from UDM. Oh, hi, uh, can you hear me? I can, yes. Yes, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> a lot of very amazing work. Um, I was just wondering, um, have you considered for the visual odometry using, uh, let's say, full fish eyes uh, instead of multiple 120 degree cameras, for example? Um, 
I, I would say, I would say, yeah, I, I think that uh, the, the fisheye overlap that we have is not really ideal uh, for what we, for some of the applications that we like. So we would like to use, move to different optics. Um, we're, we're effectively limited by the manufacturer. Uh, we, I would say that we don't have in our lab the expertise to develop that the hardware, which is actually quite, you know, quite um, sophisticated to be able to, to do multi-camera, multi, um, multi-camera synchronized image captures. So we are limited to, to what we've been able to acquire um, from a company called Seven Sense. They're based in Switzerland. Um, there are a lot of improvements to be had with, with significant overlap where we only have about 20 or 30 degrees of overlap that I showed in those images. But by having more significant overlap, you can create effectively a series of stereo cameras that, that, that stretch around your platform. And that, that, that is something that we'd, we'd be interested in doing if we had that sort of the, the hardware expertise, I would say. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, any other question? Okay, um, so then it's my turn. <laughs> okay, um, so, uh, so if I look at classical, um, classical work on um, uh, legged robots, normally people have this uh, whole body planner, whole body controller, full step planner, and all these different, so many different components running together in order to make a legacy system work. Um, mm -hmm. And then I look at uh, the recent uh, reinforcement learning work where a lot of time people just throw away decades of research in legacy robots and just, let's just do stay to talk and then done. Um, I just want to understand what's your point, opinion about this. Should we go for the completely reinforcement learning approach or should we go for more the classical approach? Um. So I think I think that sort of the, the devil is in the detail. I mean, I think that there's impressive results coming out from Marco Huter's lab in, in, in RSL, and that's particularly impressive. Um, but um, if you if you reflect on what the, what the controllers are good for with reinforcement learning at the moment, they're very good at not falling down. But the style of walking still has a lot to, lot to come on because I mean the style of walking is the, the challenge is because there is no real forward planning um, the the approaches the approaches that Marcus group and they're really impressive like they do not fall down as long as you stay away from the most challenging locations like on rolling terrain rough terrain soft terrain they make the right decisions um, but they're kind of not falling down controllers without the long-term forward um, horizon planning that we kind of in the in the locomotion community would have had always had as the goal to plan four or five steps ahead based off of receding horizon so the, the controllers tend the the reinforcement learning controllers that are successful tend to be quite stocky and uh and so i, I think that there is a challenge on how to be able to plan on in a cohesive manner i mean i think you can probably do reinforcement learning planning um to plan you know five six steps ahead based off of the, the the terrain environment and the elevation map and that's elements of that are are in the work that's coming out from there uh, I, I don't i i'm i personally am not particularly satisfied with an rl controller that doesn't work well but if you train it for another two weeks then it works well there's there is devil in the detail for example um the controller that uh, was used in the darpa challenge took three weeks to train um, and it's, it's, it is a complex combination of constraints for, for example, encouraging the robot's foot to clear the ground, you know, so it doesn't, for example, just lift, the, lift its foot one centimeter off the ground in simulation. Uh, to, for that to be reliable in grass, you need, you need to encourage it to clear its leg off the ground. Those are kind of very hand engineered details that are quite frustrating to, to see uh their usability in, in in real world systems i think that for crispness and deployability the spot controller the model-based controller that's in in the boston dynamics robot is still the preferred solution for industry for example where you need crisp reliability within a sort of narrower environment where, where there's stairs but it's flat so it, it's still not fully it's still not completely or fully in any way an rl based uh, game i would say Okay, thank you. Um, another question I have is about um, how you do work on uh, terrain with deformation. So I remember in your slide somewhere you show that um, a realist a realistic scenario outdoor is deformation. Mm -hmm. 
which I mm -hmm. agree a lot. Is once we bring an uh, animal to the to the mine with uh, full of gravel, and then a lot of stuff falls apart because mm -hmm. there was something that we didn't expect it before, and we couldn't do that in simulation because it's it's really hard to simulate deformation in mm -hmm. the simulator we have for Lady system. Um, so for me, it was hard to carry out this kind of research with deformation. Um, so I'm just wondering, what was your, how did you start it? Well, I mean, we were primarily working on the perception side of things. So um, uh, there, I mean, we're able to take advantage of uh, samples where the robot doesn't fall over, um, where, where it's just on the, on the boundary where it's making recovery steps, but not, not falling over. And then we can, we, can, we can use that to collect data sets where we can uh, adapt the algorithms accordingly. Um, I think in the learning-based uh, or in the, in the control uh, scenarios, when people, sorry, when people are doing research and control, a typical approach is to, to develop model mismatches in your controller or to, uh, to under, sorry, under limit your controller that you're, or your, the, the, the amount of tor max torque that your controller can, can take advantage of to give you some margin. But you're, you're right that um, even, even the oral work that's been very successful, typically it's just having enough margin and having a, re a reactive controller, not really having uh, slippage. I think you can change the coefficient of friction in simulation, but typically uh, that's having actual deformation and softness in the simulator is not really in any way present. That's on the, on the softness. And I think one of the key challenges moving forward with the perception side is like we're interested in doing things like exploration in forests, for example, and having photorealistic reconstruction of bushes and leaves and, and things like this. That's that's quite difficult to make that representative in general for, for terrain map uh, simulation, for example. So there, there, there is a kind of environment in which everything is rigid in simulation, gazebo, or whether it's Isaac Jim, for example, that, that works quite well, but moving beyond that is a challenge. Okay, thank you. Uh, hey, do you have a question? Yeah, um, coming from computer vision, the most exciting thing for me about robots is that you have control about the camera, where it looks at. Like yeah. in computer vision, we always have a video and do you, you have to do your best. But now, you, yeah, you, you can control it. So uh, at which stages does this play into the pipeline or does it does it play in as well into the planning or? It's, I mean, hypothetically, you you could do things like stereo camera towards where there are visual features. Uh, in reality, you'll probably see that none of the robots have necks. And in fact, I remember working with Boston Dynamics when they were revising the Atlas robot, and we asked, could you put a neck in the robot? And they sort of laughed at us because um, for the purposes of just steering the camera towards things, it's really like in a low priority. So yeah, un unfortunately, if you're like a state estimation and mapping algorithm guy, you're you're downstream from the control guys. They're the ones who decide where the robot um, is going. And uh, in much the same way as you kind of introduce the question, you kind of are dependent on what they're doing. And, and that's that's motivation for one of the reasons for going for multiple sensors. You know, there's there's probably a trade-off in, in mapping and navigation community between doing as little with as few sensors as possible versus adding more complicated sensors, which obviously are more more failures. So we, in our research, we've gone in the direction of uh, multiple cameras and multiple lasers, well, uh, so as to have redundancy. Um, and that's, that's a, brit a bit of a brute force way of doing it. Mm -hmm. certainly. So it's kind of too complicated to do, even, even for the short time planning for walking, you, you might want to first do a step to the right to see how large the rock is or so, because you, you can't really see it from the current viewpoint, but there's... Yeah. I think, I, think, like I think in many applications where it's like point-to-point -point navigation for package delivery or this exploration work that we're doing, I think that you, you have a lighter reconstruction or a depth camera that can go out to four or five meters that gives you a sense of whether there's a big hill or there's an obstacle, um, but then the fine-grained detail, you kind of just have to, have to be able to make those decisions as you go. I mean, any of the walking controllers that we talked about there were um, were mapping the terrain and then planning a few steps ahead. Obviously, as you move to very high speed motion, like I'm thinking about the DARPA self-driving car challenges in the desert, for example, famously needed to use learning to guess whether environments were were uh, 
or um, uh, predict, I guess, uh, whether they were drivable or not. Um, in, in what we're doing here, we typically have the capacity to stop if uh, within two steps there's a drop off or there's a collision or there's likely to be a collision. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thanks for the insight. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, uh, one more question. Um, so um, in, your, in one of your slides, I can see um, it was a part about um, training with the elevation map and then putting on the real robot. I'm just curious, do you see any kind of thing to real gap? Yeah, I think, I, mean, I think that was the key part. So for the reinforcement learning work, um, simulated elevation maps that are perfect and then add noise to create some spurious artifacts and then train a denoising filter that can not reconstruct the normal, the original elevation map, but to reconstruct something that would be plausible um, given artifacts. So you, we, we regularly would have spurious points that are outliers, like the, the, the real sense, for example, is an assisted stereo camera. So if there is plausible ambiguity, then you can have uh, uh, multiples of the true distance closer to you have an obstacle. So you can have a spike in the, in the elevation map. Um, so it's, it's important to be able to, um, to be robust to this. Maybe the, maybe the point is that with the, with the, the learning algorithms, we're trying to be, uh, sorry, with the RL footstep planners, trying to choose plausible footsteps from maybe where there's a multitude of, of suitable ones. It's not so suitable to this approach in environments where like stepping stones, where you just over filter everything and you've nowhere that, that's deemed to be acceptable. It, um, this approach um, works well where there is a significant amount of, of terrain where you would like to walk, but you need to choose the best step. So I, I don't think necessarily these approaches are suitable for like bipeds that are, are working on very small environments with very big feet. But in with point feet on a, on a quadruped, this is a very suitable approach. And um, uh, the, the work from Marco Hudis Group and RSL went one step further by basically being able to make very quick reactionary decisions within their denoiser to ignore and completely disregard terrain. So they were able to do things like walk up to snow. And as, you, as the robot starts to walk through the snow, you've got your elevation map from the top of the surface of the snow that might be uh, 10, 15 centimeters thick, but then to be able to disregard that and to trust effectively the foot contacts uh, almost instantaneously based off of, um, off, off of the uncertainty in the, in the contact positions. So that I think that's been very interesting that it goes very much against the philosophy of build very accurate elevation map. Okay, thank you. Um, is there more question from the audience? You please raise your hand if you have a question. Okay, then one last question. Um, so what is left for us? So, you know, after seeing that um, DAPA robotic challenge works so well and Marco has a controller that never fall, um, what's the next that we should work on? Um, when, so so yeah. what's next we should work on so we can see like robots start working on the street? Well, I mean, uh, I, yeah, I, I guess I'd say that they're, they're, they're I mean, they're moving towards being walking on the street, but um, uh, medium horizon planning is is where there's more work to be done. Coordinated planning, so the, the traditional problems of like stepping stone based uh, trajectory optimization or forward footstep planning that, that um, they're kind of being uh, blanked out because of the uh, success of the RLL controllers. But I, I think there's still room for a combination of minimal forward planning. Maybe not whole body trajectory optimization based planning, but uh, minimal forward planning that uses, for example, simple models of, of, the, of the robot to plan plausible footstep contact um, information. That's one thing. I think what my own group are interested in doing more is doing local manipulations. So I think companies like Antibiotics, Boston Dynamics, they are effectively providing inspection as a, as a capability now. And I think the research community should look at using these very rugged platforms to do field manipulation, uh, to do uh, to do pick and place, to do uh, object sample taking. Um, and there's a lot of industrial applications that look at and use cases that look at, okay, inspection is a capability now, but what about interacting with the environment? Okay, 
Okay, thank okay. you. And we have a question from Toronto. Yeah, just jump in quickly. A really impressive results, especially in the subterranean challenge maps. Those look massive and complex. Um, I was curious if there's any um, situations that arose or, or sort of surprises that you had during the competition that, you know, um, muddled up the mapping. Uh, if, there's, if there's things that were identified in that, it seems like a very unique terrain. Yeah, it was, so the environment was kind of, um, hand created by DARPA. So they, they actually, they, they had this mine in, in Louisville, Kentucky, and they closed it to the public. It was a giant cavern and they, they built in these environments. Um, I would say that when our team was traveling, we had a lot of flux because of COVID. It was the tail end of COVID and who's going to be able to travel, who can get permission from the US government to enter. Um, and the same was true for the second place team, which came from Brisbane in Australia. I don't think of any of the top four teams, any, any team would have been the, the favorites, but I think deploying in those environments and being able to set up having traveled by thousands of miles is a big challenge for any kind of robotics competitions. Um, the environment ended up being much more constrained and narrow than any of the teams expected, which yeah. actually played, it played into the, into the preferences that was our robot had all of the computers within it. Um, so there was three I-7 uh, PCs within the robot while um, some of the teams that came with spot robots, they actually put all their PCs on top of the robot mm. up to maybe the weight limit of the robots and were surprised with how narrow the environments were that the, basically they became top heavy. So I, I don't think necessarily the results of the competition indicate like a big disparity between what teams one to five. It's just, unfortunately for the teams that were, were less successful, um, that there can be a lot of variability in these competitions and you have to be really, if you're entering into a robotics challenge, you have to be motivated by the intrinsic interest in developing the science around it, not necessarily by winning the competition. So we, we were lucky is what it is, maybe a shorter way of putting it. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. Thank you. Okay, are there more questions? Oh, good. Okay, so this says uh, thanks, uh, Professor Morris Holland again for the amazing talk. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for the invite as well. Okay, hope, hopefully we'll see you again in CRV. Yeah, hopefully too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Okay, bye. okay, so sorry we're running a bit late. Um, Five minutes break. The, the keynote speaker now should be a coffee break time. And we're back at 12.30. Okay, so in five minutes, we'll start the next section. Okay. So I can see Mo is here. Hi, Mo. Um, okay, let's get started. This is our third oral section. And today um, we have one of the invited the symposium speaker, um, Professor Mo Chen. Uh, Mo is an assistant professor in Simon Fraser University, where he directs the multi-agent robotic system lab. Before starting a lab in Simon Fraser, he completed his PhD degree in UC Berkeley, and he was a postdoc in Stanford University. His research interests include multi-agent systems, safety critical systems, human-robot interactions, control theory, and reinforcement learning. Okay, so today he's, he's going to talk, talk to us about his work on control learning and multi-agent RL. Okay, Mo, so yours. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, for the introduction. So let me just get started. I guess before I get started, uh, obviously we can't talk too much within the short time period. So it's going to be, I would say, more questions and answers in this talk somehow. But I will be talking about some very preliminary studies that we've done in these areas. So the two topics I would like to talk about are going to be how to combine reinforcement learning and control to improve data efficiency in learning. And then the second topic is um, how do we do multi-agent RL when the agents are making decisions asynchronously? Okay, so first control and RL. So just a very brief slide that I wanna show every time we talk about RL, right? So in RL, we kind of assume that there's some underlying MDP governing the evolution of the environment. Um, and in particular, uh, we, we define some reward function and the objective here is to maximize the expected discounted reward, sometimes called a return as well. So that's given by this expression here. 
And then uh, the variable that we're maximizing over is going to be the control policy. And uh, with MDP, we assume everything is stochastic. So that's why we have the expectation. And the expectation is taken over the trajectories um, under this policy. And one of the just obviously skipping over most of the details in RL, but one of the ways of solving this problem is to compute what's called a policy gradient, um, which is kind of uh, if we define this to be j, j of theta, then we can compute the gradient with, with respect to theta of, of this expression. And then we can then do gradient ascent uh, once we obtain this estimate. So this is one of the forms of this policy gradient. And the key, I mean, there's a lot of math here, but the key here is that inside the expression, we have this estimation of the return of a given trajectory, that's r here, and then minus this function called b, and this function is the baseline. So basically the idea is, even for those of you not familiar with RL, the idea is we're gonna measure or somehow estimate how well we're doing, and this is the first term, right? How well we're doing is gonna be measured by the sum of discounted rewards. However, um, the idea of how well we're doing is kind of arbitrary. So we need to compare this with some kind of baseline. And that's what this term is, right? So, um, right. so uh, mathematically, uh, the gradient is estimated using samples. So it's gonna be noisy, right? The more samples we have, the better our estimate is, meaning lower variance. And having mathematically having this baseline function can reduce variance. And some of the reasonable choices is, for example, the average return over the last few episodes, or maybe the value function that we're also learning at the same time. Um, so some questions that we have while we're working on this area is, do better gradient estimates always lead to better policies? Right, so this is maybe kind of a more fundamental question about optimization in general, I suppose, right? So sometimes maybe our a landscape of the objective is very uh, non-convex, right? So, um, our gradients, everything that we care about. Um, second question is, what about this baseline? Uh, usually in the RL community, the baseline is used to reduce the variance, meaning that we can get a better estimate of the gradient with fewer samples. Um, but can the baseline do a bit more than just variance reduction? I would say I, I don't have answers to, answers to these questions, but I would like to present some preliminary results to see maybe we can all um, try to answer these questions together. Okay, so one thing we've tried is to guide model-free RL using control. And this is actually, the idea is pretty simple. Um, and it's a trade-off between control, which can solve a problem somewhat globally, right? If, especially if we use something like dynamic programming. However, control may not be as scalable as model-free RL in terms of the system dimensionality, right? So however, we're still gonna try to use control and we're gonna solve a simplified version of the problem using control first. And after we solve this problem, we will obtain some kind of value function for the optimal control problem. And of, of course, the value function is gonna be for the lower dimensional problem, right? So it's gonna be a lower dimensional value function, um, but we're still gonna be using this lower dimensional solution as the baseline for the RL policy gradient. And uh, some, so we're still studying why this is a useful thing to do, but intuitively, I kind of think that maybe it provides some kind of global guidance for exploration and RL. Um, it can also help us initialize some of the parameters for our policy as well. Um, so again, very preliminary studies, but I, I thought it was interesting to take a look. Okay, so just a bit more concretely. So what do I mean by solving a simplified version of the problem? So first we have to uh, define some approximate dynamics in a lower dimensional state space. And this is defined by S hat here. And given these dynamics, we can use any kind of uh, control methods or even value iteration um, to obtain the value function, right? We could also use MPC to obtain a bunch of trajectories from which we can approximate some kind of uh, value function as well, defined on the lower dimensional state. Okay, and then it's pretty simple. Then when we go back to computing the policy gradient, we're simply gonna set the baseline function to be equal to this value function that we have from control. Um, one of the details of that I'm gonna gloss over is that this, the difference between the high dimensional state and the low dimensional state here. So, well, intuitively, maybe we can just, maybe we can do some one-to-one -one mapping that's sometimes possible, for example, with LIDAR and access to a simulator. Sometimes we can simply fill in the missing states randomly and that 
kind, kind of works sometimes as well. Um, but uh, I'll leave that discussion out of this talk. Okay, so okay, so straight to the results here. So here we're considering a, a simulation, simulated environment with a quadrator starting here, trying to do a trying to fly kind of aggressively up and around this obstacle uh, up to the yellow region here. So the quadrator um, is using control from the motors, and it needs to first learn how to hover. And then once it can hover, it needs to know how to aggressively pitch one way to go left. And then at the same time, uh, actually in the middle here, aggressively pitch right to go up. So this is kind of a, a situation where perhaps it's a little difficult to explore without use uh, just from standard methods from RL. So here, uh, I've kind of simplified our results. So in, in blue, we have peer learning using PPO. And then in the other colors, we have a few variants of um, using different methods for solving the approximate low dimensional problem to obtain the low dimensional value functions as baseline. And we can kind of see that while the pure learning method was able to kind of learn how to hover here, and then maybe um, just uh, fly around in this little area, but it never really learned how to reach the goal. Whereas if we use the baseline uh, from control, we kind of give some kind of global guidance telling the agent that, okay, the only good outcome is to be up here. If you're just hovering around here, that is actually not so good according to our baseline. To go a bit more in depth, I, we also looked at another example, kind of a contrived example where we have a drone starting here and it has to hopefully squeeze through the obstacles here to get to the 1000 reward. Um, but there's a, another option. It can simply fall down to the left and receive a medium reward, like just 100. Um, using a purely learning based method, which is shown in green here, we see that uh, it's actually not very common for the agent to reach the goal um, shown in a solid green line. Um, rather, the agent seems to like to take the easy route of simply falling down here to receive the 100 reward. Um, whereas with a baseline function from control, we tell the agent that, okay, it's only good if, you, if you're coming up here to get the 1000 reward. Um, so using the control based baseline, we can have a much higher rate of reaching the goal as shown here and a very low rate of simply falling down to what we call the trap. Okay, so moving on, uh, I guess I'm a little short on time, so let me try to be quick here. So the second thing I wanted to discuss, again, gonna be more questions and answers. So the idea is that humans, at least I, I think hierarchically. So for example, if I'm navigating indoors, I'm thinking of maybe I'll go to the door first and then I'll pick an object up, right? And then given the high level decisions, I'm also doing low level execution, kind of doing those, those separately hierarchically. Um, maybe agents should be thinking this way and there's, there has been work shown that hierarchical RL is gonna be much more data efficient. Um, so, well, what if you have multiple agents thinking hierarchically? In that case, they're all gonna be making decisions asynchronously. So how can we, in this, in this kind of setting, how can we still use RL, right? So the motivational exa example that we have here is a water filling task. task. So imagine we're at a conference and we have three water, uh, three water dispensers for the people to use, but in the water level stochastically goes down as people drink the water. So now we have two heterogeneous robots trying to keep the water level high by delivering water to these dispensers. So we have a high, uh, high speed flying robot that can scout out the water levels. And then this, this is communicated to a slow ground robot, which can actually fill the water. So this is a motivational example. Um, and we're gonna, we wanna do, we wanna teach the robots to do this effectively using a hierarchical approach. And when we do hierarchical RL, instead of executing, instead of thinking about making the low level decisions, like going right up and so on, we're gonna be thinking about what options to take. So options simply means a high level action. So that may be navigate to table A, for example. And one thing we notice is that the decision-making becomes asynchronous because each of these options may take a different amount of time. Okay, so now some questions for everyone to think about. So what is the framework for RL to be to, to train agents in a hierarchical asynchronous way? And can such a framework be applied in other ways, right? Even in, for example, in human robot interactions, when, when we have a robot and a human, the same situation comes up when people are thinking asynchronously, for example. Okay, so I'm just gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go 
kind of just not really talk about the math too much. But the main point is that in centralized control, we often learn a policy that outputs the joint distributions of the actions of the robots. And the simple modification we can make to the policy gradient is simply instead of inputting, instead of considering the joint action distribution, we can simply use that to compute the conditional action distribution condition on the agents who do not need to make a new high level decision. So just by doing this very simple math and replacing this term here in the policy gradient expression, it turns out that we can learn much more effectively. Okay, so maybe I'll probably end with this. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll, end, I'll end with the graphs here that shows the difference. Uh, let's pay attention to the left graph. So the bottom is basically learning the low level, the low level actions. So learning is very slow. And then in blue, we have completely asynchronous learning. Um, in green and orange, we have, um, we have hierarchical learning, but in the green, once an agent finishes a high level action, it's gonna wait for everyone else to finish as well before everyone synchronously make another decision. And in orange, uh, we have all the agents, uh, whenever any agent finishes executing a high level action, all the agents are interrupted and then all of them make a new decision together, right? So these are kind of halfway between uh, low level decision-making and uh, completely asynchronous hierarchical decision-making. Okay, so I'd like to thank all my students and collaborators for all this work and thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you for the great talk. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? If you have questions, please raise your hand, use the reactions. Okay, I have a question about the first part. Um, so I know it works about um, starting with the baseline. Um, how do you know if you're choosing the correct baseline? Uh, yeah, so that's a very good question. I think it, it kind of comes back. So maybe philosophically, this is kind of about using some prior knowledge, maybe use knowing a little bit about how the environment evolves over time and somehow using that knowledge to inform learning, right? So if you use a very bad model to compute the value function here, or if your value function is just very bad, then it can probably do more harm than good. But given that we have in many robotic settings, we do have some idea of how systems behave. I think, um, for example, if you're training a car to drive somewhere or, or you're training a robotic plane, then I think a lot of times we do have a very good idea of a low dimensional model for these systems. And this is where uh, our approach could be helpful. Okay, great. And um, another question is about the second part. So I can see you have two agents coordinate with each other. Um, what if I need a lot of agents to work together? Is it going to um, increase the training time by a lot? So we have tested another three agent example. And again, it's very preliminary work, but our hypothesis is that the more agents we have, the more beneficial the asynchronous learning will be, just because the other agents do not need to be, for example, interrupted to synchronously make decisions. And they also don't need to wait for other agents. Um, so any agent can make a new decision at any time. Um, also see a question from the chat. Okay. Uh, for the, just... Yeah. So the question is for the trap reward is the issue, the sparsity of the high reward sampling during exploration phase before settling, settling into the exploitation phase. Yeah, so I kind of agree here, right? This is a very contrived example. The reward is sparse mostly the agent doesn't get any reward. Um, so we kind of use this example to really investigate, can control really help, right? So it seems like at least in this kind of situation, control does help because we using control, we can we, we have some idea of the global picture of the problem rather than just uh, locally exploring. Um, I'd be happy to answer more questions offline as well. So uh, let me just scroll through my email so you can contact me. Okay, thank you for the talks again. Um, and then I will let you take over the rest of the session. Um, you can introduce the, the first speaker. Okay. Yeah, so let me close everything. Okay, so, so our first speaker uh, is gonna be talking about inter and intracity image geo geolocalization. Uh, the authors are Joshua Tanner and James Green. Uh, 
Okay. Kevin Dick and James Green. I think Kevin will be giving this presentation. Yep, absolutely. Go. I'll share my screen. Can I confirm that you guys see this? Yeah, looks good. Okay, good. All right, so thank you everyone for uh, attending this talk. So as introduced, uh, we're talking about inter and intracity image geolocalization. So this is work completed by Joshua Tanner, myself and Dr. James Green at Carleton University. So our work really focuses on, on addressing one central research question. Can a photo be accurately geolocated within a city based on pixels alone? So more specifically, we wanted to determine whether a given uh, set of densely sampled images within a cityscape uh, can be used to learn a model that would be able to precisely geolocalize the latitude and longitudinal coordinates of those images, but also to what level of or precision. Uh, and so while this has been done at kind of various levels of uh, scale, so this has been kind of investigated at planetary and nation levels, uh, when framed as a classification problem using convolutional neural networks, there hasn't been any model yet uh, that's been able to precisely geolocalize images within a city at you know, the, the, the scale or kind of uh, high resolution level, uh, framing it as a latitude longitude regression type problem. So starting kind of at the, the, the recent work at the, the highest level, planetary scale imagery has been kind of publicly and privately available since the advent of satellite uh, based aerial imagery and it's been used in a multitudinous studies. Uh, and so the example here is Planet, uh, is a model that was used for image geolocalization by outputting basically a planetary probability uh, distrib distributional output by partitioning the world into these hierarchically subdivided tilings. So the tile sizes here were based on geotagged uh, image density, so thereby formulating this problem as an approximately 26,000 class classification problem. And then at a more focused level, uh, Workman et al. Uh, used imagery from throughout the United States demonstrating that nation level imagery could geolocalize uh, images uh, precisely, but using a combination of both ground and aerially centered satellite image pairs in what they uh, de defined as a multi-scale cross view training framework. But to our knowledge, no study has achieved this uh, street level performance from pixel information alone without incorporating some other form of metadata or complementary perspective. Uh, and so finally at the finest level, the cityscape level, uh, we, the development of these image geolocalization models would require uh, basically a data set of uh, you know, highly densely sampled images, imagery to learn these kinds of models. And so as an example of that, Zamir et al. leveraged the, a data set of approximately 100,000 Google Street View images uh, as geolocalization references to develop basically a, a SIFT based uh, or extract SIFT based uh, features that they indexed into a tree uh, to then uh, approximate you know, the, the localization of any one image through uh, somewhat of a tree-based k-nearest neighbor search. And so this figure basically shows the top-down experimental design used in our study. Uh, we first thought to localize uh, a given query image to a given city. So this is what we denote as inter-city prediction. Uh, and then we would produce basically an intrust city. So within that city prediction uh, using either a regression-based model, a classification-based model, or one of these index-based predictors. And so finally, the performance of each could then be systematically compared to determine how learnable image geolocalization can be from pixels alone. Uh, and so it's important to note that many practical examples of geolocalization uh, imagery uh, typically require latitude longitude precision on the order of four to six decimal points of precision. Uh, so those are for the, the latitude longitude coordinates. Uh, and that roughly corresponds to the ability to unambiguously resolve individual streets uh, at the scale and within or an order of magnitude of approximately a few hundreds of uh, square meters. And so this work leveraged the uh, highly densely sampled street learn data set. So this was actually a data set originally released to the navigation research community as a common cityscape representing a real world environment for training uh, navigation reinforcement learning agents. Uh, and so the images are 360 degree panoramas with uh, sizes 1664 by 832 pixels and they cover two regions. Uh, so we only considered Manhattan and Pittsburgh within this work, each having approximately 56,000 images and each covering approximately uh, 31 square kilometers uh, within each city. And so these are just two exemplar images uh, from those cityscapes. Uh, and this dense packing of panoramas represents a really unique opportunity to address this question uh, to produce CNN-based uh, image geolocalization methods that might uh, rival those index-based alternatives. So to propose a multi-city scalable methodology for this inter-city and inter-city image geolocalization problem, 
we first formulated the initial uh, geolocalization search as simply a binary uh, classification between the two cities. So the images would then be passed to these uh, intracity Manhattan net or Pittsburgh net models. Uh, and with about uh, you know 96% accuracy, the results of this binary classification problem seemed effectively solved. Uh, of course, this is only considering two cities, and we expect as the city uh, you know candidate city number grows, this problem would be considerably harder. But we only had data for these two. Um, and then passing that image to then the intracity predictor, we first sought to determine what the expected baseline uh, performance would be for a variety of random prediction strategies. So this was producing random baselines using a number of different uh, contextual information uh, to get a sense for how performance just a random model might be. And then subsequently, we want to evaluate how image geolocalization performance would be uh, with one of these index-based methods. So to that end, we extracted SIF descriptors uh, for all 56,000 images, and the images were then allocated to a respective five-fold cross-validation set that we then used with a, a FLAN, so a, a, the fast approximate of nearest neighbors, uh, for the instance-based predictions. And so while numerous studies have investigated the image geolocalization problem before, to our knowledge, none have reported results on formulating the problem as a regression-based prediction of these continuous valued latitude and longitude float pairs. And we actually suspect that uh, the reason for this is that uh, it's effectively unlearnable if you have an overly sparse uh, imagery across large data sets, or sorry, across large areas. Uh, so in this work, because we have a dense packing, uh, it was uh, worth investigating. So we basically took a uh, ResNet uh, 50 model that was fine-tuned on five-fold cross-validations over 100 epochs and demonstrated that the, and the learning curve that we see here shows that the median distance error of the regression model actually does stably decline over the 100 epochs of training. Uh, and so while the regression-based model is uh, basically producing something that we, we consider most, modest, over the entire data set, it's actually exciting to see that uh, it, it does represent uh, you know, the success of actually applying a regression-based model for this task. Uh, and then finally, we, we adapted the, the problem uh, similar to what was done on the planetary and nation level scales uh, to, to an urban cityscape. So we partitioned the city into these equirectangular bins and treated the entire image geolocalization task instead as this massively multi-class classification learning task and so the cities were subdivided using a Voronoi uh, partitioning that balanced the number of training samples per regional bin. Uh, and we show uh, basically in the figure here that uh, the classification based predictor was actually able to achieve this you know, street level of prediction uh, on this resolution of roughly 10 to the four uh, or 10 to the minus four latitude longitude coordinate precision that, uh, that we highlighted. Uh, and so we summarize all the results of the two cities here and note that the study uh, demonstrates that basically leveraging these uh, densely sa sampled uh, urban cityscapes can actually enable the learning of these models uh, to this street level image geolocalization uh, precision without taking into account any other metadata or, uh, or you know, multi-viewed uh, information. Uh, and so finally, uh, so that was just spatially. So temporally, uh, we sought to not only compare how our model performed uh, you know, across time. And so uh, in this figure, we note that the, the learned CNN classification model actually outperformed each model across all years, except for 2017, uh, where the CNN regression model was actually the most performant. And we actually, you know, from this conclude that urban level geolocalization regularities are indeed uh, learnable and temporally generalizable. Uh, and so one final and yet uniquely important discussion point to this work is uh, the consequences of these findings. So. Uh, this work actually demonstrates that with a sufficiently densely sampled cityscape, uh, images can be precisely resolved to street level. And so for an example, uh, you know, images posted online for which the location data has been purposefully stripped uh, for privacy preserving reasons may with you know, models similar to those presented in this work actually be precisely geolocated. So uh, something to, to think about in this context. So with that, I thank you all for uh, you know, this talk and uh, I'm happy to answer questions when we get to it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the great presentation. So we're gonna move right on to our next speaker. And again, we're gonna do the uh, questions at the very end. Uh, yep, so yeah, so our next speaker is gonna talk about a permutation model for the self supervised stereo matching problem. And uh, the talk would be, the authors are gonna be Pierre-Andre Brousseau and Sebastian Roy. And I think Pierre-Andre, you're gonna be the speaker today. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi guys, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who's here. I'm just gonna move this out of the way. 
Um, so I'm, um, I'm going to be presenting the paper permutation model for the self-supervised stereo matching problem. Um, so the, the question at hand here is for passive depth estimation. So you have this scene and uh, with a camera, you can take an image. Um, and the goal would be to make this link um, from this image to, it, it, to the depth coordinates. Um, unfortunately, when you have only one camera, um, if you take any pixel and get its calibrated camera ray, you have this uh, problem as to which depth should you pick in this circumstances. Um, so it, you can kind of solve this problem with, with uh, adding a second camera. And uh, with this second camera, you can essentially measure parallax in the, uh, between um, the features in the image and uh, in, in some way resolve the depth. So what does this mean? So um, you can reformulate the problem of depth estimation as this uh, disparity estimation. So um, by solving for the displacement between the stereo images. So here we have like this, this stereo pair. So on the left and on the right, and if you can track uh, the motion. So this, uh, this motion is how much as each pixel move horizontally. So um, the stereo matching process estimates this 1D displacement and would yield a disparity map. So, um, in a matching process, uh, in many uh, in many recent uh, methods, you you have this uh, cost volume or simply three D volume that is generated, uh, which essentially uh, is a disparity probability vector for each pixel. Um, most of the time, in the left image, that is then projected down to uh, the disparity map. So in this paper. Um, we propose uh, a natural representation of stereo constraints um, in the context of self-supervised deep neural network methods. So we model a confidence measure in a principal fashion as part of the stereoscopic process. And this process disentangles the stereo matching from monocular disparity estimation and extracts uh, what we will define as stereo visibility in this cause volume. So what is this permutation formulation? So if you take um, the right line and the left line in both of, the, of your uh, images, so if you take uh, one image, uh, one line from each, and you kind of want to match them, you can represent this matching process for the whole line as one single permutation matrix. So um, you could extend, you can extend this uh, as multiple permutation matrices into a permutation volume from one image, the left image, towards the right. Now, what is fun here is that you can, this model simultaneous, simultaneously solves the left to right and the right to left. So, um, and um, you can as well uh, identify where occlusions or ambiguities can lie. So how do you obtain a permutation? So uh, the most, the, an important part of, the, of obtaining a permutation is how to normalize it. So if you have uh, some 3D volume that is generated from uh, a neural network, you want it to uh, normalize it such as, such as it's doubly stochastic. Um, so our process is to, um, um, our contribution is this introduction of our symmetric normalization, um, which is an iterative process that simultaneously normalizes columns and rows. Um, and it's based on the sync or nope algorithm in optimal transport problems. So uh, you can see in the, uh, in the running GIF here that we kind of um, go to uh, a permutation solution. So permutation, uh, properties of the permutation is that it naturally discourages incoherent matches um, because the normalization effect um, is on the whole row of the image rather than each pixel individually. Um, and so, and also because you can, you can measure the entropy on each row or, or, or column, then you can, identify that high entropy relates to occlusion. 
And as we have we stated, it solves from left for left and right disparity simultaneously. So uh, a point I've, I've touched on is stereo visibility. So during the stereo matching process, which pixels are visible in both images for a stereo? So here in the bottom part, we have this left part of the image, which is not present in the right image. We have occlusions or occluded pixels, which do not appear in the right image. We have other things such as matching ambiguity um, in, uh, in the sky or reflections, which simply uh, are missing pixels. And so stereo visibility is, um, um, is modeled in the permutation model as uh, either matching ambiguity or um, occlusions or out of pixel images. In, in, in a simple way, occlusion appears as incoherence uh, induced by strong matches. So uh, in this work, we uh, use this architecture, uh, which is a multi-scale approach to, um, uh, to disparity estimation. Uh, what you can see is that um, in the matching pipeline, we generate the cost volume such as it is uh, mo more traditional, and then we transform it into this uh, permutation volume before doing the normalization. So it's very similar to using a more standard, uh, 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 what I say, cost volume approaches. So for the training losses, we can reformat them in this new format, which is, um, uh, we, we, which you can take the occlusion as part of the uh, photometric loss. So we have the standard photometric loss, but now the occlusion, which is computed on the permutation volume itself, can be a part of the uh, photometric loss. And in the same way, the left-right disparity consistency uh, can be defined on the permutation volume itself as p dot p transpose. Um, we define this simple heuristic to fill the occlusion, which is just the left fill heuristic. Um, where we, uh, where low confidence disparity are given the closest high, high confidence disparities on their left. So simply put, you can see that the most naive um, only affects um, stereo occluded pixels and makes it easy to highlight the, the, the value of these confidence maps. Right? Uh, and you can see again in this, uh, in this view on histograms that uh, we only affect stereo occluded pixels before and after uh, for this, this very simple heuristic. So for results, we show that permutation enforces uh, stereo matching and yields high quality disparity maps when using the most naive simple occlusion uh, heuristic. Also, um, we can demonstrate that using this uh, symmetric normalization, we naturally um, um, correct for um, uh, low confidence matches and we um, automatically discourage impossible matches, which tend to have this smoothing effect quite naturally, even in the absence of a smoothing loss. So thank you so much. Uh, and as a concluding remarks, I'd like to say that the, this new permutation model enforces stereo constraints uh, model stereo visibility and ambiguity as a confidence measure, simplifies the losses as to only uh, as to be on a single quantity, the permutation volume, solves left and right disparity simultaneously, and this entangles stereo and mono for uh, disparity estimation. Uh, I'd like to, thanks, to thank everyone, and um, for further questions, please feel free to email, uh, for, uh, and I'll be happy to answer. Thank you so much. Thank you very much again for, for another great talk, Pierre Anthony. Um, okay, again, I'm uh, going to do the questions at the end. So, moving on to uh, Shula Fan. So, I see that you're here now. So, okay. please go ahead and share your screen. So, uh, our final talk is going to be on occlusion aware self supervised stereo matching with confidence guided raw disparity fusion. Sounds like a very relevant paper to the last one. So the authors are Sheila Fan and Su Qian and Beris Fidan. Uh, so please go ahead. Um, hi everyone, my name is Shula Fan and I'm from the University of Waterloo. Um, it's my pleasure to present our work on occlusion-aware self-supervised stereo matching with confidence-guided raw disparity fusion. 
In robotics application, we typically use commercially available stereo cameras to obtain depth as uh, depth information. So, for example, we've already seen lots of robots equipped with an Intel RealSense camera or a Z camera. These commercial stereo cameras typically rely on traditional stereo matching algorithms. A traditional stereo matching algorithm can predict a disparity map uh, with both accurate and inaccurate disparity estimates. In this work, we call this uh, predicted disparity map from a traditional algorithm uh, or raw, raw disparity map. In the example we show here, we can see that the raw disparity map contains uh, either mis missing or inaccurate uh, disparity estimates at, for example, textualist regions and occluded regions. Uh, apart from traditional stereo matching, a recent development in data-driven stereo matching has improved the accuracy in disparity estimation significantly. Um, these data-driven methods can typically uh, be categorized into two classes. Uh, supervised methods can achieve state-of-the-art performance, but it's difficult to fine-tune these models due to the difficulty in obtaining uh, ground truth training labels. On the other hand, self-supervised models do not require any ground truth training labels, but their performance is still not ideal. In this work, what we are interested in is to combine the useful prior information provided by the, the accurate regions on the raw disparity map with a self-supervised model to enhance the performance of this model. Since we would also like to uh, deploy this model on a, ro a robotic platform, uh, this model must be able to uh, predict disparity accurately and also in real time. By considering this design constraint, we propose a two-stage pipeline um, as, uh, as you can see here. Um, the first stage is a confidence generation stage. In this stage, we identify the accurate raw disparity in the form of a confidence map. And then we design a self-supervised uh, occlusion-aware stereo matching deep neural network uh, to predict the final disparity estimate as well as an occlusion mask. In the confidence generation stage, we compute the confidence score based on two existing measures. The first one is the zero mean sum of absolute difference. Uh, ZSAD score is based on the difference between uh, the left stereo view and the reconstructed left stereo view. The reconstructed left stereo view is computed from the right stereo view uh, and the raw disparity map. We found that uh, using ZSAD only to compute the confidence scores may fail sometimes at textualist regions. And these textualist regions often contain a noisy raw disparity estimate. Uh, therefore, we propose to use um, a second measure called mean disparity deviation to quantify, um, to quantify the smoothness of the raw disparity map. After we compute the ZSAD and MND score uh, for a raw disparity map, uh, we combine these two scores by a texture-aware scheme such that the ZSAD score focuses more on the textured regions, while the MND score focuses more on the textureless region. After the confidence generation step, uh, stage, we use um, um, self-supervised model to obtain the final estimates, and we call this model CR diffusion. Uh, this model is inspired by StereoNet, which, which provides a good balance between accuracy and runtime. In our proposed model, uh, we use three different modules. The first one is a feature expression module, and then a confidence guided raw disparity fusion module. And lastly, an occlusion-aware disparity refinement module. We first use the feature extraction module to extract uh, low resolution and high level image features by using the stereo RGB images as the inputs. The, uh, the high level image features are then used to construct a stereo matching cost, which is later aggregated um, using 3D convolutional layers. Um, the, and, and then a disparity map is regressed from the aggregated cost. Uh, so far, this disparity map is only based on the model's knowledge in how to perform stereo matching. Um, lastly, in this module, we fuse the raw disparity map and the disparity map based on the model's knowledge by using uh, the confidence map as a guidance. So we essentially use uh, the confidence map to select 
uh, raw disparity from high confidence areas and also select um, disparity based on uh, the model's knowledge at low confidence area. The combined disparity map so far is at low re image resolution and it does not contain uh, much uh, loss of details. Therefore, we use an occlusion aware disparity refinement module to further refine uh, this preliminary disparity map. This refinement module is inspired by uh, a previous work on self supervised opti optical flow estimation and it follows an hierarchical design with multiple stages. In each refinement stage, we utilize um, the low resolution disparity and occlusion mass as input. We also further uh, use the high level image features extracted previously as some guidance term um, to refine these uh, low resolution disparity and occlusion mass. At the end of the refinement module, uh, sorry, at the end of the refinement stage, we'll obtain um, a refined disparity map and an occlusion mass at a, a higher resolution. To train our model, we um, use four different training losses. The first one is a disparity supervision loss, uh, which computes the difference between the predicted disparity and the raw disparity. Um, this supervision loss is also filtered by uh, the confidence map to focus on high confidence uh, area. We also use a photometric loss to uh, compute the difference between the actual left stereo view and the synthetic left stereo view. Um, the synthetic view is constructed based on the right stereo view and the predicted disparity map. This photometric loss is also uh, filtered by the predicted occlusion mass such that it only focuses uh, on the occluded area. Um, the third loss we use is the disparity smoothness loss, which enforces uh, smooth disparity at textualless regions. Uh, lastly, we apply uh, a binary cross entropy loss between the predicted occlusion mask and the, and the constant mask filled with one. And we found that using this loss can prevent our predicted occlusion mask from converging to zero. In order to fully verify different design components in our uh, proposed pipeline, we perform ablation study on the SimFlow dataset. In this ablation study, we first build a baseline model, which is essentially this uh, stereo net train uh, in an unsupervised method. And then we incorporate the raw disparity supervision loss, the confidence guidance term in the training loss, the raw disparity fusion module, and the occlusion occlusion aware refinement uh, design in, in the model. And from the results, we can see that our proposed uh, configuration, which contains all the design components, achieved the best accuracy overall. In the qualitative results uh, we show at the bottom, we can also see that the proposed uh, configuration can produce uh, the predicted disparity and occlusion mass uh, with high, uh, high quality. And next, we also uh, compare the performance of our model with some existing um, stereo matching methods uh, using the Kitty 2015 dataset. Compared to supervised models, uh, our, our method um, does not outperform their performance, which, um, which, uh, is, um, which is reasonable. But when we look at other self-supervised model, we can see that our model can uh, perform a comparative or even more accurate results. We further perform um, a runtime study to show that um, our proposed pipeline can compute the disparity maps um, with uh, even uh, with more than 30 uh, FPS, even on a medium grade 1660 super uh, GPU. The, qu uh, the qualitative results shown at the bottom of the slide uh, also show that our uh, predicted disparity map contains more detail um, than um, the predicted disparity map from a previous um, self-supervised stereo metric model uh, flow to stereo. Lastly, we evaluate our model on some custom data sets collected by um, an, an Intel RealSense stereo camera and a Z camera. Uh, since these custom data sets do not contain any uh, ground truth depth information, we are only able to provide the qualitative results here. From the qualitative results, we can show that um, our proposed pipeline can effect it, uh, effectively improve the raw disparity maps computed by these um, 
commercial stereo cameras. Um, well, so for example, we can see some improvement at the occluded regions and also at um, other uh, missing pixels at some uh, textureless regions. In conclusion, uh, we propose a self-supervised stereo meshing pipeline in this work. And this pipeline utilizes a confidence measure to identify inaccuracies on the raw disparity map. And then we use a self-supervised stereo network to, um, to compute the final uh, disparity estimate and an occlusion mask um, effectively and in real time. For our future research direction, we would like to experiment uh, with different raw disparity fusion schemes to see if they will improve uh, our model's performance even further. We would also like to enhance the training process, uh, the training process such that uh, we can fine tune our model on different data sets easier. Of course, more ev evaluation with uh, different commercial stereo camera can, uh, is also needed to fully demonstrate the potential and performance of our uh, model. Lastly, we would also like to apply this proposed pipeline to other robotic applications, such as in control, in planning, or in, uh, in SLAP. So uh, thank you everyone for listening to my presentation and please let me know if you have any questions. Great, thank you so much for the great talk. So now we can uh, have 10 minutes of questions. So, um, and the questions will be directed at any of the talks that we just had. So uh, any questions for any of, of the three speakers? Yep, uh, Jordan, I see your hand. Go ahead. Uh, I had a quick question for Pierre Andre uh, regarding uh, his use of optimal transport uh, within his uh, uh, framework. I was just wondering how you came to choose optimal transport for specifically for matching and if you ran into any uh, time and space complexity issues uh, with incorporating it into your framework. Yeah, thank you for your question. So why did we go about choosing, what, how did we find out about optimal transport? Or, so um, we kind of had this, we have this expertise in calibrating large fisheye views. Um, and we use these kind of distortion maps to, to rectify um, large fisheyes. And so this, the idea of stereo is how do you find this like distortion such that you, you, you reach the, the other view? And naturally, if you think about it as, as like this a distortion, instead you, you think about it as a permutation because of unicity constraint of the opaque objects, then it becomes quite like, okay, I'm searching for a permutation now. And when you think of how you search, then you go down the literature and then you kind of go about um, how, how they solved it in more uh, recent years. So the, the sync or nope algorithm, which was guaranteeing um, uh, doubly stochastic, solves for, for rows, then columns, then rows, then columns iteratively. But we kind of reworded it such that it solves both simultaneously um, by normalizing along both simultaneously um, uh, in our equation. Um, and we have to uh, limit the number of iterations. So we kind of limited it at eight iteration in this case, and it works quite well. And um, it tends to like converge qu quite quickly. So in, 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 in how we, we ran our, our practice, uh, our, our tests. So it kind of worked well. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Did, did that answer? Yeah. yeah. Th thank you. Okay, so any more questions? So I have a question about the, the first speaker. So Kevin, I guess, and, and co-authors. Uh, it's kind of a high level question. I was just wondering for the, um, do you get better accuracy in certain parts of the city versus others? So for example, if you're in a forest with all the trees, they all look the same. I can imagine maybe the distribution would be very wide. And then if you're at a very recognizable landmark, you could have a better accuracy. Like, do you see something, something like that in your results? Yeah, that's something that uh, is kind of common across all cityscapes. So the idea that when you're in a very uniform 
kind of uh, area, whether, you know, <clears throat> suburban, you know, neighborhood that all houses look roughly the same, we would tend to see, you know, we, we could, we could get localization to an approximate area that on average uh, did generally well, we would get more of like a neighborhood level accuracy, but, you know, precisely resolving something that looks so similar uh, is really challenging. Um, the one the one model that did do that actually very well. So when we think of like a very uh, uniformly visual or visually uniform uh, neighborhood, the the SIFT models or the the, the K nearest neighbors with SIFT descriptors actually could do quite well because there's minute differences there that uh, the SIFT descriptors would catch. And because these are 10 meters apart, uh, you know, including uh, you know a dog that was captured in one uh, frame that also appears in the next, are are you know not not the information that we would necessarily want our model to focus on, but help at least in a SIF descriptor or like a K nearest neighbor method, you know, it, it would be able to capture that, you know, regularity or that, that, that information that we don't really care about. So, uh, so, so it is something that uh, the models generally will, you know, focus on. Um, and, and there's really interesting ideas that can kind of derive from that as well. You know, if we wanted to take, uh, you know, uh, you know, an, an embedding or an encoding of imagery from, from one city and another uh, and try to like map between two cities, you know, can we identify visually similar regions even between two cities that would be challenging for you know our intracity uh, predictor yep. so so that information is is interesting it's it's captured by uh, some of the models but uh, yeah I, I think that roughly answers your question but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that's really intriguing from this work just to follow up again another naive question just wondering because if we take a picture with our phones let's say mm -hmm. the, so most photos or devices will already capture metadata which includes GPS coordinates yep. right? Yes, so exactly. can you comment on in what situation would would you not have this information or maybe is there something wrong with the metadata that we get automatically yeah no it's a, it's an excellent question i mean it kind of goes down to uh, you know what, what's the purpose of this this work really i mean it was really uh, an investigation into uh, you know the answering this question on how you uh, you formulate a regression or a image geolocalization that's a regression based problem uh, every camera that exists, you know, in, in the modern age has EXIF data, X, uh, e -X -I -F, so it, it captures a whole bunch of, you know, standard metadata that, that is available. The real idea here is, you know, for, for privacy preserving purposes, if someone is, or if we have, you know, some image that, you know, is posted online or, or something that uh, for, for whatever reason we want to strip the metadata, uh, you know, whether this could be used by, you know, police departments in the context of, uh, you know, there's some image captured in some context that we don't have this metadata, can we, you know, localize to a certain area, you know, the, this idea of surveillance and, and whatnot uh, in, in, you know, not the, the prototypical context where, you know, we upload things to, uh, to Instagram and, you know, we know it's the Eiffel Tower, <laughs> we know pretty much precisely where it's taken. So, so that there are contexts where this could be used and it was more of a, a question that we were answering on, uh, you know, how feasible is this and, and what that would represent, uh, you know, more globally. Um, I think, yeah, is, uh, is the, the main motivation. But I mean, for, for any other context, I mean, we're using Google Street View data, the, the Google cars that are circulating are capturing way more, you know, uh, metadata and, and, and information than we need. But it also shows that, you know, that, you know, Google could take for any city, you know, an entire sampling, generate these models. And for any image that appears, you know, online, probably precisely geolocated to exactly where it, it came from. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I can see for the police application, even yeah. localizing to a neighborhood, yeah. maybe from some questionable images that don't see very much, right? That sounds like it's very useful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so any, yeah, thanks a lot for your answer. So any more questions for any of our speakers? Maybe uh, let me ask a question to the last speaker. Um, again, I it's not so I don't really work much in stereo vision, so this could be quite naive. Um, but I'm wondering. Um, so I work more on navigation and planning, right? So what's really important for me is I want really good accuracy for the near objects, right? So so can you comment on the accuracy as a function of distance to the to to, to any of the uh, the depth map, I guess. Um, we didn't um, explicitly uh, explicitly um, did any uh, evaluation in terms of uh, the accuracy and uh, and the depth, but um, 
if we look at the uh, Kitty 2015 evaluation um, server, you can see that they provide, uh, they, they define the um, evaluation accuracy in terms of a foreground and also um, like background um, for your prediction, I say. Um, so in that metric, um, we, we didn't see a big, the uh, deviation between the accuracy between our foreground pre prediction and also the background prediction. Yeah. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. And uh, is, is there a sense of which direction are the errors? For example, from a safety perspective, if my error is too far, sorry, too, if my error is too close, yep. that might be okay. okay for planning, but if my yep. error is too far, that wouldn't be so good. Like, do, do you see any patterns there? Um, so far, not really. It's, um, it, um, most of the um, error we've seen so far uh, focus uh, uh, or are concentrated more on, let's say, uh, mirror objects or uh, high reflected, highly reflected uh, areas. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Any more questions? I think we probably have time for one more question. Can I ask a quick question to the last speaker? Um, so I know your input depends on the disparity map, right? And we know disparity map might come with very different quality. Um, would it affect your method? Um, yes, uh, actually. Um, so when we, um, so in, in our training, we uh, use the um, open source uh, stereo matching algorithm to compute the raw disparity map for public data sets. Well, we found that um, even using that open source um, stereo matching algorithm, we get a different accuracy on the SimFlow data set and also on the Kitty data set. We typically get better results on the SimFlow data set and no results at Kitty data set. And that does affect our overall accuracy. Um, one, uh, one place that's very evident is the quality of our predicted occlusion mask. Um, in the SimFlow data set, we have very defined, very clear predicted occlusion mask. But when we move on to the Kitty data set, the predicted uh, occlusion mask between uh, uh, become uh, less defined and have contain some, uh, some noise. And we also, yeah, so that also transform um, to the results in our predicted disparity map as well. So, so yeah, to answer your question, um, the accuracy of um, um, your disparity inputs uh, does affect the final prediction. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, so thank you to all the speakers and all the questions and answers. Um, so I think that's all the time we have for this session. Yeah, and uh, thanks Mo for coming to tell us about your research. And thanks everyone for attending the second oral section. Uh, I believe we'll have a lunch break. And this is also the AICRB steering committee meeting. Um, everyone is invited. So if you're interested, please join. Um, otherwise, the next oral session will start at 2.30 in Toronto time. Okay, see you there.